Hey, he's gone. <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. My name is Wayne. How you doing? Thanks for coming. Um, I'm just going to hook straight into it. Um, I'm here to tell you about a project that I was involved in um, over the last couple of years. Uh, it's um, pretty nerdy. Um, it's the stuff that I do, the stuff that I've done over the last probably five years or so, and this project in particular is very, um, in terms of typography, it's very niche. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is, is take you a bit um, through the process, but also hopefully enlighten you a little bit about how typefaces work and, and how they're designed, um, and just some of the, the particular characteristics um, of this project that I think are kind of relevant to all people involved in the design industry. Um, firstly, let me just see if my little doovie works. There we go. A little bit about me. A quick couple of slides just to um, let you know how I got to this point. How, how did I become the guy that um, was asked to design Australia's national font? Now, when I say Australia's national font, I'm inflating it a little bit, if I'm honest with myself. But as we go through, you'll see what I'm getting at. I was asked to design a typeface that had um, national character imbued into it. Um, I was always um, a drawing kid. I was always uh, you know, interested in creativity, and visual creativity. Uh, and this was the first time that I can remember that, um, you know, I, I, that, that I became aware that I could do something visual that was you know, a bit better than most of the other kids. Um, this was a competition to beautify a building site in Newcastle Mall, 1979. Um, I was really into cricket at the time. So I painted a picture of this cricketer, who was one of my childhood heroes. Anyone named the cricketer, by the way, from my quality illustration? Anyone got a guess? No one? We've really moved on in eras, haven't we? <laughs> not Dennis Lilly, no. Not a bad attempt. Who said Greg Chapel? Well done. You get to buy my drinks later on. <laughs> That's your prize. It was Greg Chapel, yeah. Um, here he is hitting a four through the cover side. Now that I look at his grip on the bat, I think no right-minded cricketer would hold the bat like that. But this was one of the first, um, one of the first creative times where I did something that, um, uh, you know, that kind of got some attention. And I won a bike for that, which I rode for years and years and years in the bush, which was great. Um, another thing that happened to me when I was young was this. This is my 1977 Letra Set catalogue. I still have this catalogue at home, beaten up and battered. Um, you can see, um, where's my laser pointer? See up there it says Alan. Alan was my dad's second cousin. Um, I'd only met Alan once. Um, I'm about 14 years old, I think, at this time. Alan was a commercial artist. Um, he had a studio somewhere in Sydney, in North Sydney, I think. He was a heavy smoker and he developed emphysema and died, I think around the age of 60-something. Uh, and my dad was the closest family member that was given the task of um, going into his art studio and cleaning it all out. And I wasn't really aware that this is what he was doing. He just disappeared one weekend. And he came home on the Sunday afternoon with a car full of stuff from an art studio, pencils, brushes, papers, books, um, and font catalogues. Among them was this one. And he said to me and my brothers, you know, before I throw this stuff away at the dump, is there anything here that you think that you might like? Um, and I remember just coming across this straight away and I looked in, inside it and it's full of all these crazy 70s fonts, you know, like the one that the goodies used for the goodies logo, that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and all your Helveticas and all that kind of thing as well. And, uh, and that was the first time I became aware of what a font was, what a, what a typeface was and how just the way that you draw letters can have expression, um, visual expression to them. Since then, <coughs> I, um, I went to university in the... 1980s. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I, I studied a, a communications degree. Um, I didn't really know that design existed as a profession back then. Um, I wish that it, I wish that I had more awareness. I became aware of that sort of during my communications degree, and so gravitated towards design. Um, outside of uni, um, I didn't have any real design skills. Um, I kind of not quite lied my way into my first design job, but I did stretch the truth somewhat. Um, I told them I was able to use Apple Macs, one of the first little studios that had some very early Mac SE30s, you know, the ones with the screen the size of a postage stamp. Um, and I just learned how to use them. And that was kind of my first part-time um, design job, was working on a, a, a very rudimentary magazine. 
Um, that's not what I'm referring to when I say I made my own job, but as my design time went on and I went through a few agencies, um, I found that the, I gravitated towards typographic solutions all the time with the design stuff that I was doing, so logos and identities and things like that. Um, and the fonts that were available to us back then, um, so we're talking mid-90s onwards type of thing, early mid-90s onwards, it wasn't the font menu that we all have available to us today. It was much more restricted. Um, and the font purchasing landscape didn't exist back then as well. It wasn't something that was really properly available. So, you know, all our identities and logos would always have Gaudi in them or Helvetica or, and they kept looking the same. And I was frustrated with this and thought, you know, maybe if I start to draw some of my own bits of lettering. And clients would say sometimes, that's great, can we have the font? And we go, oh, sorry, it doesn't exist. And the AEs, the account service people, always get annoyed at me. Like, Why'd you do that? Have we got the font? We've got to give them the font. Um, so it became apparent to me over time that this typography thing was a thing that I could do. Um, and so I started to push myself towards that. And I started my type foundry part-time when I was still a full-time employee. And I would work on it um, in my spare time and evenings and try to design fonts and try to learn how they worked and how to build them and what character sets were, all that kind of thing. Um, and it took some time. I think it was 2000 or 2001 when I started my first horrible, hideous website that I designed myself. Um, I wish that I could show you a screenshot of that website, but I don't have it. But it was the worst website. You, you'd all run screaming from the room, I guarantee it. Um, but a few people bought fonts off me mysteriously, and I thought, okay, well, there's something going on here. So I started to work towards uh, being self-employed and being a full-time typography person. My, my idea was to be a typeface designer. Um, 2006 was when I left employment and became uh, full-time. It took somewhat of a fairly big risk. Uh, and that's when I made my own job because there was nowhere for me to go to learn how to design typefaces. In Australia, there still isn't anywhere that you can go. If you say, I want to be a type designer, I want to learn how, there's nowhere you can go to be taught it. Um, or actually, there is somewhere. I'll tell you about it at the end, but it's me that's doing it. Um, but it, nowadays, you can go overseas. You can go to Britain or America, and you can do full-time type design. But you can't here in Australia, and it's um, kind of difficult and certainly wasn't available to me. So I had to just work out how to do it myself, and I made lots of massive mistakes. Um, I learned bit by bit through trial and error. Um, I broke things and ruined them and um, got frustrated and threw things at my screen and tried to decipher information from forums, technical forums and things like that. Um, and now that I look back, I think it was only because I had such a deep interest in it, I just thought, no, I'm not going to give up on this. And I actually think, because I'm also a, um, a teacher, a, a typography teacher, and I often say this to my students, you know, you, you should just make sure that if you really want something, don't let those barriers get in your way. Um, so that's kind of what I mean when I say I made my own job. Nowadays, um, I do a lot of teaching in typography. So this is a photo from a hand lettering workshop um, in New York City just a few weeks ago. Uh, the first one that I've run in New York City. I've run a lot of them here in Australia and um, in New Zealand. Um, and it's not like I have these plans for world domination, but I really wanted to go to New York City and uh, you know, spend a lot of time preparing um, and um, building up to this workshop and arranging it and had a great time. So nowadays, I spend all of my time um, designing typefaces, um, advising about typefaces, um, doing hand lettering work, or advising other people how to do hand lettering work, or teaching classes in typography. So everything I do now is available, um, sorry, not available, everything I do now is related to typography in some way. And it's taken me like 20 years to get there. Um, anyway. I could talk about myself all day, but that's not why I'm here. The brief. So this particular project, ABC Sands, the guys from ABC emailed me. The first I knew about any of this was that um, a, a design team leader from ABC here in Ultimo in Sydney um, emailed me via my website and said, we've got this project. It's, um, they called it a visual language system that was meant to um, unify the brand across all of ABC's platforms. And I just remember reading that thing. Well, I didn't think it was disunified. But when they took me through the brief and I started to look at the various websites and the divisions and radio and Triple J and TV and digital and all that stuff, there was some disunity amongst it. 
Um, in particular, they had, I think, something like, something like four or five separate sans serif typefaces that were being used, some of which are still being used as well. Um, and so they came to me and they said, we're doing this whole rebrand and part of what we want to do is develop a typeface that helps us to unify all these things together so that whenever anyone sees it, there'll be a subtle cue that this is ABC. Um, and it's part of this kind of wider design system, but we're looking for someone to do this typeface for us. Um, the brief that they gave me was a document about 13 or 14 pages long. And it had all the usual briefing stuff in it. Some of it was technical, some of it said, you know, we want this number of weights and we want the typeface to do this kind of job and that sort of thing. But one of the unique parts about it is along with the brief, um, they sent me links to some um, online interviews um, that they had done themselves. Did my mic just drop out briefly then? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the interviews with, with um, really well-known design leaders, people like Hans Hulsbosch, for instance, and Reg Mombasa, uh, and they were shot by ABC camera crews and interviews. And all they did was ask these people, what does Australian design mean to you? Um, can you tell me, is there an Australian design style? If there is, you know, what are some of its signifiers and things? Um, and the answers across all these interviews were completely fascinating and really, really super useful context for me to start this project. Um, I can't tell you what those answers were really because they were all sorts of answers. Some of the people said, I don't think there is an Australian design style. I think Australia is still too young a country and you need more than 200 years of history for that to really percolate through. Whereas others talked about indigenous art styles and, and things like that. But there was certainly no clear answer. Um, that's not to say that those interviews weren't useful to me. Um, but the, in the brief, when I really thought about it over a week or so, it came down to three questions, three primary questions. How might the ABC create a more coherent experience for the audience? So that was what the um, design team leader had contacted me about initially. We want to just make this coherent for everybody. Um, how can it uh, encapsulate our multicultural and eclectic Australian identity? And how can ABC Sam's typeface become a uniquely recognisable master brand identity carrier. Now, I thought about these and I thought points one and point two, they're kind of largely covered by the guys at ABC. Like point one, how might it create a coherent experience? Well, that was part of their wider design language system. They had a whole team of people working on this. The font was just one cog in that wheel. Uh, point three, um, how can it become a uniquely distinguished master brand identity carrier? Well, I thought about that and I thought, okay, um, once I've done this, um, if the font's applied consistently in the way that it should be, um, that will probably do that job. I wasn't too worried about points one and two. Um, but po uh, sorry, points one and three, but point two frankly frightened the pants off me. Um, how do you reflect the Australian identity in a font? Um, and this is kind of how I was feeling about that um, under a great deal of stress and pressure. And at the beginning, I actually had no idea. I literally had no idea how I was going to do this. Um, how do you represent, how do you represent any mood in a font? You know, we all look at fonts and think that's got a particular tone of voice or a mood, but if you had to design it to have a particular one, how do you do it? Let alone national character of a whole country. So the obvious thing then is to first find out what is our national character. So at the beginning, um, I spent a fair bit of time looking into or trying to find out what I think a national character is. And obviously it's not definable, everybody's got a slightly different opinion about it. But look, I did what any good researcher would do at the beginning and I asked Facebook. I went onto Facebook and said, hey, everyone out there that knows me, what do you think the Australian national identity is? And I got all sorts of stupid stuff, as you'd expect. Australia, Khan, mate, thongs, you know, all of those kind of things. Well, yeah, I know all those words, you know, great, beaches, beer. But it also, there was lots of Aussie words that came out of those sorts of conversations as well that you can see on the right side there. Things like rip snorter, I love rip snorter. Tight ass, one of my favourite words, I love tight ass. Yeah, nah, anyone know yeah, nah? Coming over later, yeah, nah, I've got to do a thing, but yeah, nah, yeah, probably. Well, which is it? Make up your mind. Um, knob, <laughs> well, I don't know if that's uniquely Australian, might be British, that one. It's actually bonk backwards, in case anyone hadn't noticed. <laughs> but lots of people said things about Australian animals as well. You know, that cliched overseas view of Australia about all our dangerous animals, drop bears and you know, sharks and snakes and all that stuff. But during this, I came across a dangerous Australian animal that I'd never heard of. I was born here, grew up here, lived in the bush when I was a kid. I'd never heard of this one. It really exists. Anyone seen these before? 
it usually gets a gasp. Bush lobsters, what? What? These really exist. This is a picture from the, I think it was the Gold Coast Bulletin, Gold Coast Advocate, something like that. These things are freshwater crayfish and they live in the mountain rivers and streams and apparently they can roam out of the creeks up to like five or 10 metres. And there's cases where people are walking along a bush track and come around a corner to be confronted by one of these things snapping at them. I mean, it looks really aggressive there. I think it's actually only about that big. I don't know. But I just put it in big red type. Just looks dangerous, doesn't it? Yeah. Anyway, if only you could convince people that they dropped out of trees. <laughs> that would be great, wouldn't it? Like the drop bears, the drop lobsters. Um, out of my Facebook research, I also got this as well. Does anyone know what this number is? The John Bradman number. Yeah, that's right. John Bradman's batting average. Um, so it's kind of become a bit of an Aussie icon number. And someone typed this um, in my Facebook research. And, uh, and I remember saying, oh, yeah, actually, that's interesting, isn't it? You mean in an Aussie legend kind of way, 99.94. And he replied and he said, oh, no, I meant in a near enough, good enough kind of way. <laughs> I don't know how they're just so Aussie. So was he. So, you know, well done, Wayne. Um, PhD in research on the way because you went to Facebook. Didn't get a lot out of that. Um, but then I did start to think about, okay, what kind of imagery represents Australia? The cliched stuff like this, wide brown land, all of that stuff from the, um, you know, the Dorothea McKellar poem. And so this kind of thing is familiar to every Australian, but not every Australian has experienced it, and certainly very few live there. Most of us live somewhere more like this. Something like 80-something percent of Australians live within 20 kilometres of the coast. And, and I was looking at this thinking, this, to me, is what the wide brown land is. This is a really familiar kind of landscape. Um, and this kind of thing as well. And it started to get me thinking about, you know, what's, what sort of imagery like this unifies all Australians. And this kind of stuff, I think, does. It's, it's more kind of, um, not just the coast specifically, not that specific, but more like a sense of open space. I started to read a Tim Winton book um, called My Island Home, or Island Home I think it's called, in which he talks about um, growing up in coastal Western Australia and what Australia means for him and talks a lot about Australian identity. Um, he used one phrase that really stuck with me, our impossibly open sky dwarfing everything. And that's what we have here in Australia. You go outside every day, it's sunny. The sky is just so big. It's hard to find a way to describe it other than just plain big. Uh, and so this idea that open space is something that's familiar to us all. When you talk to Australians who've been overseas for a long time and you know, they come back and they go, yeah, I'm, you know, I really like that generous sense of space that we have here. Um, Tim Winton also said, Australia remains a place with more land than people, which I thought was also an interesting, um, interesting quote from his book. So this idea of connection to place, I, I started to latch onto that as a kind of an identity key. Um, so elements like open space, which is the one that I ultimately concentrated on, the good old larrikin element that we all kind of know, um, the little bit of rat bag that's in all of us. Um, and also this proudly inclusive kind of idea that we're a multicultural, inclusive, welcoming society. Um, how do you get that into a font? So at least I'd probably started to narrow it down to some characteristics. Proudly inclusive and larrikin, I don't know how you get that in a font, but open space, it had a physical-ness um, to it that I thought maybe I can do something with that. Um, both, both, those first two are really abstract, but the third one I thought there's something concrete in that. But at this point, I had to take a sideways deviation because I thought, okay, um, one of the things I do need to know is what other fonts are out there that have been designed with a similar purpose, national identity. So I went looking. Didn't find too much. Did find this one, relatively recent, only from the last five years or so, Sweden Sands, designed by some um, well-known Swedish designers for the Swedish government for use in government documentation and government websites and I think road signs as well was one of the um, uses. Um, I put the capital Q up there because I looked at it and I thought, why, is it Swedish? How do I tell I'm not Swedish? I don't really know any Swedish people. But I did ask around a bit um, and some answers came back from some Swedish people. They said, oh, that Q, that Q is so Swedish. And I said, how is it Swedish? And they said, well, the, the straight um, tail it's quite unusual for a capital Q. Usually the tail sticks out the side or the bottom right, but that straight tail, 
they said there's this principle in, in Sweden, this national characteristic, it's apparently called lagom, L-A-G-O-M, which means not too little and not too much. And this cue, as well as the minimal sans serif, unfussy nature of it, but this cue apparently represents that and the, the Swedish people <coughs> latched right onto that. So I'm starting to hone in on how you can start to get national characteristics in a font. Here's another one that I'm sure you'll all be familiar with, the um, Johnston Sands typeface that's originally designed by Edward Johnson, I think 1911, something like that, and its job was to be a typeface that was for underground um, a railway system signage or transport signage. It's kind of since become iconic to England, part of that partly because and the colour scheme used and those, um, that round um, railway underground sign identity. Um, it was not designed to be an English typeface. It wasn't designed to represent Englishness. It's kind of taken that on, you know, through a hundred or so years of um, tradition and being used in a particular way. So it kind of had it, but also kind of didn't. Um, and also Helvetica, uh, which, you know, Swiss designed and very much represents those Swiss kind of identity traits of precision and thriftiness and, you know, nothing unnecessary. But really, that's all I could find. If anybody out there knows of other fonts that have been designed with a particular national characteristic purpose, I'd certainly really like to be told about them to see, because I'm, I really wanted more research into that. So anyway, by this time, I'm going, okay, I need to stop reading and start doing something. I should point out that uh, this is, after I received the initial brief, it's probably four weeks later by this time, and I still haven't been awarded the job to do this. I'm, it's still, well, I wouldn't have called it a pitch. It's not really a pitch stage, but they did say to me, you know, we're talking to other people as well. Um, I had to find a way to produce a presentation that convinced them that I'm the person for this job. So the concept, how was I going to do this? So I, I, um, I just started to scribble stuff. And some of it really stupid, like this. <laughs> like Uluru in the serifs. I had this idea, I thought, oh, what if the serifs, you know, had this vagueish Uluru? What a dumb idea, what idiot thought of that? But the idea is that you've got to, you've got to at some point, get off your bum and start drawing things down uh, and not be not edit yourself, not be worried if you think that they're wrongly directed because they can lead you to other ideas. Um, another thing that I drew initially was this idea that all of the letters would have this heavy baseline that connected everything, um, you know, in this connection to land kind of reference, very oblique reference. But, you know, there's clear legibility issues with that. So, you know, I just started scribbling around. Um, I bought a um, sketchbook. Did I go accidentally too far? No. Um, I bought a sketchbook and just started to put all this stuff in it to document the um, project from start to finish. So here's a little taste of the kind of thinking that I was trying. I'll use my pointer here. So up here, if you look at this font, Adele Sands, you can see that these gaps in the letters are known as apertures, um, kind of like a harbour, you know, that a ship would sail into and out of, and they're not particularly big. Um, one of the problems with those fonts Lovely, beautiful fonts, but one of the problems is at very small sizes, those gaps can start to close up, particularly under, say, poor printing conditions or a, or a coarse pixel grade monitor, an older monitor. So my idea was to open those apertures up, to redesign the letters so that those spaces were bigger and more open. I could sell that on the basis that it was a legibility feature at small sizes, but also it had this kind of reference to inclusiveness, this open armedness to it. Um, my open space reference, I, I had this idea that I was going to widen the measure, produce this wide font that had this sense of generosity about it, a subtle sense of generosity. Um, and so I kind of put a, a Del Sands there just so you can sort of compare width-wise. It's a subtle difference, but it's definitely wider. During my sketches, I also hit on what I thought was a little bit of genius. There's the ABC worm. They call it the worm at the ABC. It's officially called the Lisa Zhu. That's the proper title for that shape. Um, no one wants to say Lisa Zhu, they want to say worm, don't they? I do. Um, and if I rounded the corners, like on the diagonal bits like N's and V's, it would have this subtle reference to the rounded parts of that, and it would have an ABC-ness about it as well. Um, I'll talk more about that particular um, conceptual idea in a minute. Um, this is a couple of photos of the sketchbook that I um, kept, uh, and I just chose this particular page because the final result largely came out of those, those two particular initial drawings. Even that was full of all sorts of scribbles and notes and um, largely useless stuff. 
Um, you see on the right here, that's my early experiments with a rounded font because part of the brief was that we want this to be able to cover across the children's programming as well. So my idea kind of had as a DNA this sans serif typeface that I could also produce a rounded sausage end version of that was suitable for um, a softer look for the children's kind of programming. Um, I started to expand those drawings to something that was a bit more serious drawing wise. So what you're looking at here is a stack of um, A3 pieces of drawing paper, uh, tracing paper I should say. And I just started drawing this alphabet uh, and I tried sans versions of it and serif versions and semi-serif versions and ones with weird serifs on them and all sorts of stuff in different weights as well and you can see the ghosted ones underneath. In the end I did about 40 of those. I just sat at my drawing board and did them over and over and over again. And I didn't have any specific direction in mind other than the stuff I've already showed you. I just kind of wanted to get my head inside it. And the only way that I can do that is just to draw over and over again and feel like I'm starting to, um, to own it, in a sense. Um, and again, bear in mind that at this point I still hadn't even presented my concept to the guys at the ABC. So about six weeks after the brief arrived, um, this was the day of the ABC meeting. This is in Ultimo down here in Sydney. Um, and there was all of those people there in the room were um, from the design team. They all did various things. Some of them were content managers and some of them were designers and some of them were managers of the, um, the, the budgets and that kind of thing. Uh, and I took this picture and you can see the projector at the end there. So it was pointing up to a screen at the end of this table. Uh, I took this picture while we were waiting for one of the really big bosses to come along. Um, his job was just to sit in and just check that this was, you know, all on track so that later on they could say yes or no. Um, also, when I got there, you'll see these guys with the camera on the left-hand side. They said to me, oh, g'day Wayne, how are you going? Hope you're okay for your presentation. By the way, we're going to film it. Might form part of a future documentary. <laughs> no pressure. Great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. Um, so I did my presentation. Um, at the time I walked in there, I was still deeply apprehensive. I was not convinced that I had a concept that had any genuine merit to it. Um, I was hopelessly nervous. I, I felt that what I was going to present was you know, a bit undercooked, frankly. I was, I don't know, flailing around a bit. So I went through my PDF presentation. It took me about 20 minutes. Um, the main boss person had to go to another thing, got up and left. Um, and this guy here, Peter, uh, was my primary contact. Uh, and he took me aside after the meeting, said, that's great. On you. And I said, oh, OK, so when will I find out? And he said, oh, no, I'm telling you now. You've, you got the job. I said, just like that? And he said, yeah, yeah, the contract guys will send you something. And so I said to him, oh, OK. Um, I was a bit un uncertain about my concept. And he said, oh, we all are, but um, it's OK. We just wanted to make sure that you really thought it through. We really need an Australian to do this, to be honest. And some of the other people we're talking to um, aren't Australian, and that kind of makes a bit of a difference in this. And I thought, fair enough, fair enough. So in the end, um, my concept wasn't as undercooked as I was worried about, as it turned out. This was my first alphabet um, that I did after, based on those drawings that I showed you. I loved this alphabet. I looked at it and I was quite proud of this. Not quite proud, very proud. A couple of things I'd like to point out. There's the um, rounded bottoms on the diagonal letters there. Um, although not in the N at this point. Um, double decker G there. I love those kind of Gs in a sans serif. I, was, I spent all day on the vectors of that single letter, like all day about 800 iterations of it. Um, and ultimately, that G got dropped. <laughs> Almost immediately, actually. Um, which is normal, and I'll show you why. This was, I, I sent a very rough first beta of those, um, that alphabet I just showed down to them so they could put it into some um, online content on a test server. And they sent me back this link, and I straight away went, oh my god, there's my phone, it's in ABC, it's got Doctor Who on and everything. And it took me about half an hour to calm down. But after I did, I started to really look at this. If you notice the Gs there, can everyone see? See how they're closing in? They're lumpy and heavy. The B and M are lumpy and heavy as well. This is the kind of thing that I'd, I would expect out of a first beta. But, you know, straight away it was obvious that something had to happen with that G. Ultimately, it got changed back to a standard G shape. And this is part of the typeface design process. So I've, I've learned not to get too closely wedded to particular letter shapes because it's too painful when they get dropped. So, um, At this point, so I've gotten through um, the pitch part, you know. I've shown them that I'm thinking about national characteristic and that kind of thing. Um, 
If I'm to be brutally honest, at this point, the design guys, once it had all, they'd said, yes, we've, the budget's been approved, we're going to move ahead with this. They didn't care that much about national identity. Okay? That was kind of part of the, um, the original idea, was just to show that we can sort of try to build some of this in. But I think they were honest enough to understand that you can't really do that in any kind of truly meaningful way. Right? You look at things like Sweden Sands, I think it probably is there. And I'm hoping at the end of this, when you've all had a good look at it, you might you know, give me some comment and feedback about whether you think it has an Aussiness to it. But in the end of the day, legibility is paramount. This thing was going to appear on millions of screens, millions of things in print, millions of whatever. And if people can't read it, so a lot of those things, like the rounded corners on the worm and so on, um, ultimately it got dropped as well because those rounded corners don't suit pixel-based screens quite so well. The squares work better. So at this point, it became an exercise in refining for legibility, and the idea of national character was kind of sidelined a little bit. And some of the things I'm going to show you next hopefully will explain why. So legibility was emerging as the primary driver. I think form should follow function, personally. Now, if you look at Gil Sands on the left here, those four letters in order from left to right are capital I, lowercase i, lowercase l, and number one. Oh, and they look the same, don't they? This one's a little bit thicker, that capital I. That was all well and good in 1931 when Gil Sands was designed. Nowadays, in the age of passwords, fonts like that can be a nightmare. So we started to talk about legibility features. So in this case, um, capital I was standard, but the lowercase i had a little horizontal bar, so it can't be confused with something else. Um, lowercase l's got this hook on the bottom, and the number one has a horizontal bar as well. And there's all sorts of stuff like this through the font, where um, the letter shapes themselves are dictated by legibility considerations as much as design aesthetic. Here's some more examples. Um, the large X height, this is well known as a legibility feature. So if you um, are a designer and you need to cram a whole lot of copy into a small space, your first thing you should do is look for a, a typeface that has a large X, site, X height, where all the action happens in as much of that sort of space as possible. Um, the ascenders, I make them a little bit different height to the capitals. It just helps them to be visually differentiated. You make those counters and apertures as open as you possibly can. Um, and this little feature in the K, I was quite proud of this one. It's like a little bridge. And uh, all it really does is open up those two white spaces, top and bottom, which again helps it to be recognisable and um, appear crisply and cleanly at small sizes. It's not original. I didn't invent that little bridge. I later found out lots of other fonts have done that kind of thing kind of percolated through my mind, I think. So a little feature that I just kind of included. Um, other issues that I never really expected to crop up, but now that I look back, it make complete sense, were things like accessibility. So um, the ABC has um, a charter, and that charter has to, uh, means that the content they produce has to be as inclusive as possible, and that includes people with disabilities, including reading disabilities and visual impairment and things like that. So a, a, an accessibility expert got involved in this project and they said, well, for starters, if you look at things like P and Q, um, you know, people with certain kinds of dyslexia can flip them in their mind and they can be hard to discern which is which. So our solution was to make the spurs mildly different. You can see it's a wider spur and it's a thinner spur. So just, and the, the actually, if I flipped them and laid them over the top, you'd see those bowls are actually marginally different shapes as well. Subtle, but there. Um, if you look at U and N, if you flip them, the, um, the, the U is slightly wider than the N, and the place where the rounded bowl joins the stem is slightly different in the N as well. Things like that. The, this sort of stuff happened in some of the other characters as well. Um, running through the numbers, um, I included in the fonts a set of um, old-style numerals or non-lining numerals. I personally prefer them. I think they look better. And I wanted to include those numerals in the standard keyboard positions rather than your standard numerals up there. Um, because I felt that um, they, both of them were in there, but you would access, access the other set of numerals via the um, alternates, palettes, and things. But I just felt that the um, lowercase numerals, the non-lining numerals, work better in text. That's what their original purpose and intention was. And the ABCs. Um, content was mostly text-based, so we would have sentences that had numbers in the middle of the sentences. You know, Wayne was born in 1967 at 13 Smith Street, something like that. 
rather than columns of figures in, a, say, an annual report. Ultimately, I didn't win that battle. Um, the standard numerals, well, whoops, pressed the wrong button. The standard numerals were included in the standard keyboard positions, but these are in there. And again, I'm gonna get back to that again later on. Um, other issues cropped up that I didn't expect as well, things like this. Um, if you look at the red arrows there, you can see that my drop J and drop Q um, caused a bit of an issue with on-screen titles. Uh, they really wanted to crunch them up. They wanted to um, save as much screen as possible for the vision. Q is natural. Q um, almost always has to have a tail that sticks below. You can do them so it sticks just out to the bottom right there. But J is not normal. It's normal to have a J that's more like this. But I don't like those Js because they make my capital spacing more difficult. If I have a drop J, the letter before it can space up to it nice and neatly. I'm obsessed with spacing. You may be able to tell that by now. Um, so I've convinced them in the end um, not to change them but to include these Js and Qs as alternate characters so that the users anywhere could access them if this particular issue cropped up in some kind of way. As it's turned out, every time I see it, it's got this standard J and Q in it. And I don't know whether they've just decided this isn't that big a problem or the users don't know that the alternates are there or how to access them. But they're there, that's all that matters to me. Um, as we went through all these refinements to the initial alphabet, um, it eventually culminated in what we called workshop day, where all of the design team and a couple of the tech team, we all met at ABC in Sydney for a whole day um, and we put big copies of the entire alphabet as it stood up on the wall. You can see the G there, it's not the double-decker G anymore. <laughs> um, and I, I took my laptop with me and we would upload, like make, make minor changes to to individual characters and upload a new beta and they would put it into live content so that we could view that content on as many different screens as possible. So you can only see some of them there, but um, we had laptops of various ages and devices and desktops of various ages and TV screens and all that sort of stuff. And we'd try to look at any problem characters across as many sizes and screen types as possible. Um, it took us all bloody day and we made lots of, lots of really subtle minor changes, tiny little node movements and things like that. Um, and that's kind of the first time I've been through screen testing of that level, that kind of level. So after all of this, let's get to the actual final alphabet. And that's it there, that's the final regular weight of the alphabet. Um, you can see that I've included the old style numerals there. Did I mention that I prefer them? <laughs> May have mentioned that. Um, the, so this is a major milestone. From this point, this is approved. This basic alphabet and numbers has been approved. Uh, so all of the rest of the DNA that goes through all of those other weights and other parts of this has to be extracted from this. Um, and when I say all the rest of the DNA, I mean things like this. So that's the actual character set. Most people would look at that and go, oh yeah, that's a font and that's its character set. This is the real character set. And the previous screen was, what, the first two and a half lines of that. So this is a character set, it's a standard international character set that covers all languages that use the Latin-based alphabet. So it certainly does not cover things like Greek and um, Cyrillic and um, you know, Asian languages and things like that. That was part of the original um, negotiation as to what it did and didn't need to include. But it certainly needed to cover all the Latin alphabet characters. And it took friggin' ages, I should say, especially the kerning, oh my God, the kerning. And that's just one weight. There was eventually 11 weights of this typeface. Um, let's have a look at some of the other weights. So the one that I'd originally designed was this one, the regular, but out of that also came a lightweight, uh, a bold and a, a black. There's other weights that came as well. There was a single italic that was related to the regular, not a full family of italics, they only wanted a single one, and the rounded weights, and I'll show you those in a minute. Um, the, the way that I developed those weights was I used a system called interpolation. Um, and this little animation kind of gives you a bit of an idea. If you build the vector outlines in Illustrator and in your font program of the lightest weight and the heaviest weight, you can set it up so that you can drag a slider and generate a font at any point in between them. And the reason I do it this way is it takes a fair bit of extra work, but it's happened to me before. Last thing I want is a client to say, yep, we love it, that's great. Oh, actually, that medium weight, can we have it just a tad bolder? 
And you saw all that long character list. If I have to go back and individually embolden each and every character manually, it takes a long time. So I much prefer this, even though it takes more time at the beginning. Here's the other weights. Um, italic at the top there. Bold condensed, which I really like. I was very proud of that one. A single, a single condensed weight for special purpose. Uh, and here's the two children's programming weights at the bottom there. Um, so the fonts in use, this has all been done and dusted and finished and they started to roll them out around about, I'm forgetting, I think it's probably September last year was when I first saw um, these things in use. The first place that they told me they were in use was on the mobile app for ABC Me, the children's programming, and you can see the rounded weights in use there and there. Um, so it was, you know, this lovely moment for me. It's actually real, it really is happening. Um, after that, they told me that they'd relaunched the ABC mobile app for um, mobile devices. Um, so I immediately opened up an iPad and went to have a look at it. And, and they're using the heavy, bold weight as the headings there. Um, after that, they rolled it out to the ABC corporate website and then the news website. Um, this is curious, uh, is that there's the ABC fonts in use up there and through the headings and here. But this other stuff, the body text, is still aerial. Curiously, um, I'm not sure why. I'm unable to really find out why. Um, I've had a chat with a couple of ABC people who suggested it's not necessarily because there's something wrong with the font. I mean, if you know they used it in those and there was some issue and it didn't work, I'd hope they'd ring me up and say, "Can we deal with this somehow?" Um, I think it's more likely to be that the rollout takes a long time, or that someone hasn't pressed a button somewhere. Maybe I don't know. Um, it's been also suggested to me, I'm not a web designer, but it's been suggested to me that um, fonts like Arial that are you know, engineered to within a pixel of their lives and they can get those file sizes nice and small. Some of the bigger web systems have um, you know, style sheets and cascading systems where they, you know, if a font's too big or doesn't load within a prerequisite time, it defaults to next one down or something like that. Um, also, earlier this year, I think it was around April, the um, ABC News 24 relaunched with a new appearance as well. So you'll be familiar with graphics like this from the last few months. In particular, the ticker across the bottom of the screen that's um, you know, there 24-7. It's been this fantastic opportunity for me to look at it day after day and really, really closely look to see whether there's any you know, thing that I might have been able to do better or any issues or is it really performing the way that I want. And they're also using it in display versions as well. So there's this kind of super thin outline version. Um, they kern it up nice and tight in capitals. Looks really nice. Um, the weather, I'm obsessed with weather. I love the weather. So this was the most exciting bit for me to see them used in the weather. Uh, and there it is all around Australia. Love that. Um, and also the, um, the currency screens. Remember I talked about the numbers before, how I would preferred them to use. Well, they didn't. They used the others as default. But I look at this. That's low res, unfortunately, because it's from my old standard def TV screen just shot on my iPhone. Um, but those numbers are big and brash and lovely and really nice. In fact, the 8, I was never that happy with the 8, but once I saw it on the screen, I thought, yeah, I quite like that 8. Yeah. In fact, it reminded me of a story um, that a colleague of mine many years ago, a guy named Darren, he used to say, he, um, his way of saying that he liked a font is he would show you a, a print sample with a font on it, like a capital G, for instance, and he'd say, see that G? And I go, yeah, and he said, if I was a G, I'd want to have sex with that G. <laughs> that was his way of saying. So I look at that eight and think, oh, anyway. <laughs> Love numbers. Um, this is the condensed, um, bold condensed in use. This was a digital exhibition um, that related to the, I think, the 50th anniversary of the Indigenous referendum from 1967. And I looked at that and I thought, oh, that's really cool. I love the look of that. If I was a G, look at that G. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, so it's really interesting to see um, the font in use in both text and display usages. And if you ask me if a font works in both text and display use, especially in text, then that's, that's a good win for me. But it's not all roses. I mean, there's been a few things I could have done better. Things like this, for instance this pair of letters, L-I. Remember I spoke earlier on about how there were specific legibility features built into them, the little bar and the hook on the L? Well, it's actually made my spacing more difficult. That bloody L-I spacing, 
it's a really common pair, and every day, literally, I see that pair of letters somewhere on screen, and ah, damn, it's racing, I didn't get it right. Even since this has all been done and dusted, I've even gone back into the files and just for my own purpose, I'm going to fix that spacing just so I can say that at least I attended to it. And I spent an hour and I still couldn't get it right. I don't know what it is about those, I think those legibility features have been great for people to be able to read it, but have made my spacing job harder. If you can imagine if they were just straight vertical bars, the spacing would have been mathematical, precise and perfect and lovely, but it bugs the bejesus out of me. Anyway. Um, there's also lots of stuff that I can't control that happens with my fonts and the way people use them. Stuff like this. Uh, this is a screenshot that I took from my phone. Um, articles where there's lots of numbers that appear in text, so I enlarged it here to show you. See, there's the standard numbers, 70 meter, 10, and down here I've just reset it using the proper numbers. Have I mentioned that I prefer those numbers? I may have mentioned that. And it, you can see that's, I hope, a good demonstration of why these numbers exist. They just read better. They're better for legibility. But the buggers aren't using them for whatever reason. Um, and this sort of stuff, I never would have thought of this. This never occurred to me, but this someone somewhere at the ABC, mistake or otherwise, I don't know, had set this um, in italic and with some tracking, with some excess tracking. That's a design aesthetic choice, I suppose. I can't control that. But if you look at a word like bushfires, which has a built-in ligature in it, you can see that the ligature won't space. It's a, it's a full, single character. So this is what it should look like down here. But when it's spaced out, the ligature doesn't space and suddenly looks like sticks out like a sore thumb in terms of spacing. I just worry that people look at that and email me and go, oh, yeah, you can't see what I'm placing in a typeface, can you? <laughs> uh, anyway, what's been the response? since it's been out there? Well, overwhelmingly positive, but that's no fun for me to talk about. I'd rather talk about stuff like this. Um, a couple of things have happened. So you can imagine that um, a project like this for the national broadcaster, everybody that's grown up in Australia, people that live here, have lived any length of time, everybody loves the ABC. People feel a sense of ownership over the ABC. I know that I do. And so, that, you know, it's very easy to... Um, inflame tensions around issues like this. Um, there has been some commentary around waste of taxpayer money and that kind of thing. A couple of, in particular examples, was this fellow, Chris Kenny, on the left, uh, and he had this section on his, um, his program on Sky News that was called Media Malarkey, I think, in which him and a couple of panellists talked about, you know, why does the ABC, and it's this frivolous spending on, on a special font. And he actually said, I'll quote, reading off my screen here, New Times Roman or Comic Sans, None of that's good enough for the ABC. New Times Roman? No, not Times New Roman. So a little bit of research might have, anyway. Uh, on the right there is um, Senator Chris Patterson from Victoria. Now, the ABC, like any public institution, rightly, is, um, should be accountable for its budget and its spending. And so um, ABC's team, the boss, in this case, the, the head of the ABC, Michelle Guthrie, gets asked to go to Canberra and front Senate committees from time to time. I think it's twice a year or something like that. And the ABC font was brought up in one of these Senate committees. You know, why is ABC spending money on a font? What's, what's the reason for this? And I just thought, really, you know, <laughs> of all of the things ABC spend, might spend its money on. But anyway, Michelle Guthrie answered the question with clarity. She just said, well, all major institutions need to pay attention to their public image and to keep it unified and consistent. And he, after that, he just kind of moved on. But, you know, this is up on YouTube. You can go and look at it if you want. I just thought, hey, I've made it now. I've been mentioned in Senate. <laughs> anyway, um, the thing that James Patterson wouldn't know and Michelle Guthrie wouldn't know, because nobody really asked me, um, nor would they have a reason to, is that um, ABC was probably spending more money on fonts before this project came along. They had six or seven corporate sans serifs that they were using, really well known. Things like, um, I think Proxima Nova was one of them, beautiful sans serif typeface. Um, and they would have to pay probably annual license fees. And you imagine the number of employees in ABC that might need access to those sorts of things. You know, it's a lot of money. And with this one, they pay a one off fee and they own it forever. So hopefully it stays there forever. Um, but, you know, I felt that I'd really made it when I mentioned on. Sky News, maybe, or in the Senate, but you really made it when you mentioned in column eight, I think, Sydney Morning Herald. 
Now I'm going to read this first one out for you because I feel it needs a particular accent. <laughs> Have my eyes grown dim? Asks JB from Campbelltown. The ABC font lately for business, news and sport and sadly even for the John Clark tribute has been difficult to read. Can someone see to this please? No worries John, yep, I'll fix it for you, easy. Um, and I like the bottom one as well. Terrible graphic design, both in background and font selection. <sighs> what can you do? You can't, you expect that. At least I know it's out there and people are looking at it. So, anyway. Um, but the important thing is, this is my mum and she loves it. So, <laughs> she reckons it's great. Um, so, I just thought I'd finish off with a couple of little things. Here's some, um, an overview of the some statistics, statistics around this. Um, the time it took me was from September 2015 to February 2017. 18 months, not 18 months solid, I didn't get up and work on it all day every day, but you know, there'd be periods of two or three weeks where I'm working on it a lot and then there'd be a period of, you know, a month maybe more where I'm waiting for feedback or whatever. But you know, 18 months long project, these things are really, really long. Total number of fonts in the family was 11, 11 weights, number of betas, so that's where I send them a test font and then we make changes and I do another test font and name it beta 2, beta 3, etc. 21. Most of the font projects I do don't go beyond about beta 5. Total number of characters, 4,345. Each individual one of which had to have its kerning pairs checked with each individual every other character. There are systems that you can use but it's tedious. There's like two weeks of solid kerning involved. Um, 30,000 plus kerning pairs. I kind of, I know it's, I made that number up so it, it was too hard for me to actually work it out, but I know that it's north of that number. Um, and destination screens, well, I don't know, 20 million plus. There's 26 million Australians or 27 million. Those of us that have devices usually have more than one, TVs in our house or screens or whatever. A bloody lot is the answer. So, you know, there was a lot of pressure on that. So, conclusions. Out of all of this, um, does it contain the Australian national character? Well, I'll come back to that in a sec. But I did want to say that working on a project like this, um, well, it's nothing short of a privilege, really, I think. So I, I'll always be grateful to the ABC design team because they were really inclusive. Um, they let me, you know, they knew that I had expertise in a particular area and they let me do what I needed to do. But they also weren't afraid to drag me back on track when they felt that I might have been going a bit off brief or something that didn't suit their needs and outcomes. Um, but they really respected my professional experience, which is great. Um, and it, it helped to make it a, a genuinely collaborative um, outcome, I think. Um, I truly feel that the final result is probably, you know, there's a fair bit of them in it. It's not just my work. Um, and, I, you know, when that outcome happens, I think that's a fantastic thing. Um, does it contain the Australian national character? Well, look, I don't know. But I like to think that since I grew up with the ABC, um, that it's probably infused with a certain Aussiness. It might be infused with a certain waneness. I don't know if that's different than Aussiness or not. Um, but I'm just too close to it to be able to see. I, you know, I don't know. So, you know, after this, any of you out there in the break, feel free to come up to me and say, yes, I do think it looks Aussie or I don't think it looks Aussie or I think it looks German or something. I don't know, okay? Um, I'd really, really be interested in your opinions. Um, but look, if it's, if it's taken some small place in Australian kind of design culture, well then to me that's enough of a success. Um, and just to finish off, I thought I'd tell you about what I consider to be the best font joke ever. I came up with this font joke during the production of this um, and I was never brave enough to use it. <laughs> and the reason is, if I show you this next screen, I wanted to say to the guys at the ABC at some point, um, look, you know, if, I think that we should include an extra weight. I think we should make it a reverse italic. And when they say, why reverse italic? I'd say, well, because it leans to the left. <laughs> best font joke ever. But I was never brave enough to use it in the end, so I put it in here instead. So it's not only the best font joke, it's the only font joke that exists that I know. Um, so that's pretty much it from me. I just wanted to finish with a quick ad. If anyone's interested in learning how to design typefaces, remember I said at the beginning, there's nowhere you can go. Well, I run short courses in typeface design up in Newcastle where I live. Anyone's interested enough, feel free to check out that website there. Um, email me or email Pump House and um, inquire about it. Uh, and that's it from me.